I'm Jim Juno, and this is Light the Camera Author, where we talk about movies, television, and everything in between. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to the Light the Camera Author YouTube channel and check out the new website at lightcameraauthor.com. Joan Crawford, The Essential Biography, explores the life and career of one of Hollywood's great dames. She was the leading film personality for more than 50 years, from her beginnings as a dancer in silent films in the 1920s to her portrayals of working-class shop girls in the Depression 30s to her Oscar-winning performances in the classic films such as Mildred Pierce. The late Lawrence Quirk and William Scholl produced Joan Crawford, The Essential Biography, in 2002, and Scholl joins us now to talk about the new paperback version of his book. Hi, William Scholl. Welcome to Light Camera Author. Thank you very much. Now, your book, your book and Lawrence Quirk's book, uh, you, you two are co-authors, uh, the late Lawrence Quirk, was uh, Joan, Joan Crawford, The Essential Biography. Now, this book came out originally in 2002, but it's, just, right. it's just now coming out in paperback. Now, It's a new uh, trade paperback edition. Yes, why did it take so long for it to come out in trade paperback? That's, I guess it's, it's because of the renewed interest in Joan Crawford, thanks to uh, the TV series, Feud, Betty and Joan. Oh, okay. And that created a lot of more interest in Crawford and Davis. So uh, they came out with the uh, audio version of the book and now the uh, new paperback edition. And I have a feeling a lot had to do with the TV show. I would think so. That was a, that was a highly rated show that came out with... Um, talking about the feud that really wasn't um in your in your book it, you go into detail that um people thought there was a feud and it was over the movie uh whatever happened to baby uh whatever happened to baby jane and um but there really wasn't a feud between the two of them was there for most of their lives no they were busy with husbands and careers and children and had other things on their mind, all the uh, all the things that go into maintaining a star lifestyle, keeping your career on the top. They couldn't really be bothered with that. It was only with Baby Jane, when uh, Davis was nominated and Crawford wasn't, and she understandably was a, a little jealous. And there was some maneuvering about accepting the award from somebody else on uh, Oscar night, and that infuriated Davis and. Uh, that was really the extent of the feud. It was over the Oscar and, and uh, Betty Jane. Imagine that. The rest that, was up. And Betty Davis really, really felt she should have gotten the Oscar that year. Didn't she? Well, she sure did. She yeah. always felt that she had a lot more talent than Crawford, and Crawford always resented her for it. Amazing. So, yeah. But the feud, like you said in the book, out an earlier, an earlier film, not with Betty Davis, but an earlier film of Joan Crawford's, well, there was a manufactured feud uh, between the two stars, and it was it was uh, encouraged because it sold it sold movie tickets. That was the women, the women with uh, Norma Shearer. Yes, and then later on there was a real feud on Johnny Guitar because Crawford and Mercedes McCambridge hated each other. They really did hate each other. A lot more than Davis and Crawford. That was on Johnny Guitar. Really? Is that right? And that's, and that's one you don't hear about too often. Right, yeah. That's uh, considered a psychological Western that was, some people think it's ahead of its time. Other people think it's, you know, a load of garbage. It depends. You know, and both viewpoints, the interesting thing about that movie, both, both viewpoints are kind of correct. You know. Now, this book, this book, you, you've done, you and now, uh, Mr. Quirk died, I believe, in 2012. Is that right? Yes. So, but you and him went into detail. He knew her for at last, I believe, in the book, you say 30 years of her life. Is that correct? Yes, that's true. Yeah. So you had you had unique access to one of the great dames of of old Hollywood, and I found out a lot about her that I didn't really know about. Now, but first off, I want to ask you: Were you a Joan Crawford fan growing yes, up? I was. You were okay. 
Well, I was a fan of, you know, the horror movies, you know, when I met her one time, I mentioned that and there was a sort of awkward moment because she hated that period. She really did. And, uh, you know, and I quickly said, oh, well, you, you were very good in those, you know, don't, you know, she was okay. She was nice to me, but I was a fan growing up of Baby Jane and Straight Jacket. That was, you know. Oh, I, I love Straight to me. Yeah, I, <laughs> I was love to meet the straight jacket. <laughs> I love straight jacket. That I always thought that was one of her under under uh, valued films in later career. Yeah, quite good in that one. And of course, the last film she doesn't. Nobody wants to remember is Trog, but um, we'll get to that yeah, later yeah. on. Um, her young life, she would she did not have it easy in her in her young life, did she? She didn't have a what in her young life. She didn't. She didn't have it easy. I mean, I mean. Oh no, she did not have. It. No, no. Yeah. She didn't. Her. Because, uh, uh, her stepfather molested her, which uh, made her very sexually precocious, and it really impacted on her whole life. Made her mistrust men. It's probably why she never had a successful marriage, except for the last one. Well, I tell yeah, because that's. Alfred's yeah, she started being molested when she was age when she was eleven years old by her stepfather, mm -hmm. but she blamed she didn't yeah. blame him. She blamed herself, which a lot of victims, which a lot of victims will do. And it lasted. Sadly, you still see that going on today. It lasted up. It's sad. It is, yeah. It lasted up until she was what about sixteen when she left home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it, it was. You know, it just struck me as odd that um, that even today, like you said, that is that is something that victims often do. They blame themselves. Um, but she always spoke highly of her stepfather, didn't she? Yeah, she never thought of him as a molester. She never thought of him that way, you know, which is ridiculous. Of course, he was. I can In imagine. many ways, victims don't even realize, you know, uh, the impact it has on their lives when they're older, and then that then that led to experimentation uh, with with the uh, the lesbian lifestyle. Um, was she, in your opinion, was she bisexual or hypersexual, or what would you call her? I would say she was bisexual. Although one could argue that victims of child molestation often, when they're older, are confused about their sexual orientation which may lead to the experimentation. But uh, I think her chief interest was always guys, men. Yeah, but you do mention that uh, Barbara Stanwyck and her had a relationship, which I was not aware yeah. of went until I read your book. Um, but the also, but you know, you, uh, she undergoes, an, she finally gets out of that household and goes to Hollywood. Uh, MGM, they spot her at a dance contest, one of the, one of the talent scouts, uh, scouts. Yeah. And, um, but they want her to change her name. She was born Lucille Lesseur. And I always heard the old story that, that Louis B. Mayer said, it sounds like sewer. But you, uh, you reveal in your book that that's not the case, is it? Well, that was, uh, they felt that she had there were stories about her going, making the rounds that they felt uncomfortable with. They thought it'd be better to give her a brand new identity and get rid of all the, the rumors that was going, going around. So they picked out a new name, which she hated because it sounded like Crawfish <laughs> instead of Crawford. But William, so that, uh, yeah, William Haynes, who was openly, uh, openly gay in the 1920s, actually it ruined his career. Um, he became an interior decorator, one of her best friends. And um, mm -hmm. he had a great saying that about the name Crawford. Uh, Crawford. It's something he called, used to call a cranberry. Cranberry instead of crawfish or crawford. Cranberry was his nickname for her. Because it said it's yeah. better than cranberry than, because it could be a turkey on for, for her and stuff. Um, right. Tell me about her brother, Hal. Hal was basically a hustler in, in every sense of the word. Uh, he used her, you know, he was a very handsome guy. He came out to Hollywood hoping he'd 
be just as successful as his sister was. It didn't work out that way. He didn't have the talent. He didn't have the, the drive. So she had to support him and their, their mother as well. And uh, so that was very, very difficult for her. And he tried to blackmail her. He was going to print stories in the papers about her, her carryings on, particularly when she was younger. And uh, so they, they did not have a good relationship at all. Not at all. He was going to spread Today. a rumor. It is, yeah. Um, he was going to spread a rumor that she had done a, uh, I guess he would call it from by today's standards, a soft porn film or several before she hit it big. Yeah, a blue movie, but that's never turned up. It's never turned up. You would think it would have. So I, mm -hmm. I think that's uh, a possible. <laughs> I don't think she ever actually appeared in a blue movie. When you were writing this book, did you, did you, uh, how hard was it separating the rumors and the legends from the actual facts? It could be hard, except I always went to the source, which was Larry through Joan. It was Joan, particularly when she had some vodka in her, mm -hmm. did not hold back. She always, she always said what was on her mind. So that's where Larry got a lot of his material about her thoughts about co-stars and things like that you know she uh so it wasn't all that difficult figuring out where she was coming from and what was going on in her life because she she told people she told larry and other other friends so basically so, so basically i mean she she volunteered this information readily um, yes she did amazing because you know you'd think a lot of people would just want to hide that during the uh during their careers but um, like you said, she would be a, it would be a couple of vodkas and and it, she would open up for it. Yes, she and her, would make late night phone calls to friends. She would literally call people at one or two in the morning and drunkenly. It was sad. You know, she was lonely and she wanted to talk to people and she didn't have all the sycophants surrounding her like in her younger days. So she call and have long conversations about what, what was going on in her life until some people just had to cut her off, you know, it was too much. Her mother wasn't, uh, wasn't much better than Hal, it sounded like in your book. No, he, she, was, uh, she, she was competing with her daughter. She felt her daughter, just like Joan thought, blamed herself for what happened with her stepfather. Her mother blamed Joan and uh, she always resented her. She wanted to live off of. No, they never had a close relationship either. That's too bad. And you're don't let down by the family. Now it comes through in the book that this is almost a this is almost a love letter to Joan to Joan Crawford and her career. And there's nothing and nothing wrong with that. But I was wondering, um, did you what what first made you decide to write this book? Well, I often felt that uh Christina Crawford's book really did a number on her mother. Mm -hmm. And I found that the book wasn't all that credible. I found uh, she seemed to remember conversations that happened when she was like five years old. And, and a lot of it, I just thought had to be either wildly, wildly exaggerated or fabricated. Her sisters who were in the house at the same time said none of it ever happened. It was fake and fictional. So I thought, and her reputation took a nosedive. Here was a woman who worked very hard to get somewhere in her life. She reinvented herself. When she was nearly washed up, she got an Oscar for Mildred Pierce. Mm -hmm. She kept on striving. Whatever her flaws, and she certainly had flaws like we all do, she deserved a little more respect for her career and her hard work. And she was trying to do a joke, and I thought that was unfair. And see, and I, I got, it comes across in the book. and. Um... Now you did, I want to talk about Christine in a few minutes because I'll say it honestly, you're not a fan of Christine Crawford. <laughs> it come, that comes through in the book too. And, um, but I want to talk to her, I'll talk about, yeah, yeah. huh? Uh, I'll talk. I, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I'll talk about that in a moment, but I want to, the early, the early years, uh, Our Dancing Daughters, that was the first movie that she really shined and that really started her career off. And um, tell me a little bit about that movie. 
Well, it was uh, the first film that put her over, that made people sit up and take notice, that developed a huge fan base for her. She was, uh, you know, a struggling young woman, you know, with, with the problems that the fans could relate to. And the movie was very successful and it really started her off uh, on a major career. Up until then, she'd been doing some good, good work, but this was the picture that put her over. I found uh, I found out from your book that she did her own makeup. I didn't realize that she, even after she, she made it big. Well, she felt she knew how to how to look her best. She knew how to do it better than the cameraman. <laughs> the makeup man. Now, she liked to be in control. There's no doubt about that. And she knew what made her look good. You know, I, I always got struck by how she looked in her early films. <laughs> Our Dancing Daughters, Grand Hotel. I thought she was beautiful in Grand Hotel. Um, and with the, with the big eyes. And, but later on, she kind of changed up the makeup with the heavy eyebrows and the heavy lipstick. Um, am I right in, right in reading it that way or am I wrong in that? Yeah, she, she did develop a new look. That's true. It was kind of harsh a bit, but that's for some reason, that's what she wanted to do. So. If she felt it worked for her, if it worked for her portrayals, then that's why she did it, I guess. It was harsher, though, definitely. Yeah. Her relationship with William Haynes, that lasted the rest of his life. Um, they, were, they were actually very, very good friends, weren't they? They were terrific friends, and uh, she helped him a lot. She helped him get, his, get into business when his career was washed up. She always said that he and... His partner, Jimmy Shields, had a, the best marriage in Hollywood. <laughs> she was very, uh, yeah. And he stuck up for her his whole life to, as well. And uh, he decorated her apartment more than once. And uh, they were, had a very good friendship. That's what I was going to say, that, he, that she used his services as an interior decorator um, several times. And, um, and one of the things that, that people used as an example of her control addict addiction was, was that she would make people take their shoes off before they come in before they come into her house but you write that there's a very good reason for that wasn't there no she had very expensive rugs <laughs> <laughs> when you spend like a thousands of dollars on rugs sure you want them uh, everything to look pristine and they were they she were had a beautiful apartment and they were white also. She didn't want, uh, yes, yes. So yeah, they don't so, she didn't want people tracking in dirt. Either. Really but that was one of the true, things yeah. that was one of the things people used against her after she was gone. That um that you know she was a control freak, made people out to to take off their shoes before they come in. And um anything they could think of to say against her, they would do anything that they could use was grist for the mill that she was a control freak, she was evil, a child abuser, and anything they could think of. It, was, it became, I felt it became kind of ridiculous. Let me ask you, her, now she, you said she was married four times. The last one was to the, uh, I want to say the chairman of the board of Pepsi. Am I right? Is that the right title? Yeah. Uh, and when he, he died, uh, he died in 1959 and she, she took over his spot. Um, how did that, how did, how did the she other, became, hmm? She became the queen of Pepsi-Cola. I was going to say she, she, but she worked her butt off promoting Pepsi, which a lot of people don't realize. Yeah. She went on tours, always with plenty of Pepsi and vodka, went on tours <laughs> promoting, uh, you know, she, she was really determined to do a good job and she became their ambassador for Pepsi-Cola and what Alfred started, she, she finished in uh, really making it a major company, a major uh, software company. That's all due to the Steels, both of them. Yes, I, I believe Alfred Steele, that was his name? Did I Alfred get that right? Steele. Yeah. Yes. Now, she leaves MGM. People tell her, don't do this. Don't. I mean, she signs with, I believe, Warner Brothers for much less than what she was making. Yes. Why leave MGM? Yes. Bad projects? Is that all it was? 
Oh yeah, she was getting one crappy movie after another, and mm. she said, "This is what what's go if this is what I'm going to get. I'm not going to have a career to begin with." So she decided to leave, and they didn't stop her. They were figured enough is enough. She they didn't want to pay her a lot of money. Her pictures weren't making as much money, so she saw the handwriting on the wall. So she went to uh, Warner's, and for Warner, it she wasn't paid a lot. And Warner's, they put her in, eventually, they put her in a movie called Mildred Pierce, which gets her her that Oscar. The, that's right. That uh, revived her whole career. She did a string of hits, Mildred Pierce, uh, Possessed, Humoresque, and later on, Sudden Fear, another Oscar nomination. And uh, she really, uh, she kept going. Other actresses would have, that would have been the end for them, but she kept going. Let me ask lucky you, and she persevered. Let me ask you, if there's a movie that, that you like that the general public may not have heard too much about, what would it be? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've heard of Sudden Fear uh, and Rain. Autumn Leaves is not as well known. Autumn Leaves is a very good picture. She plays a woman who's in love with a man who has is mentally ill and she has some good scenes at the end when he goes to the institution. And she's told that when he comes out, he may not be the same person. He may not have the same feelings for her. And she's very effective at the end when she finds out that he does still care for her. That's a good picture. That was Robert Aldrich. That was before Baby Jane. She worked with him uh, uh, first on Autumn Leaves. Not that well known, but it's a good picture worth seeing. Did she do a movie called Strange Cargo? She did. That was with uh, the great love of her life, Clark Gable. Clark Gable. That was a weird one. <laughs> <laughs> Very weird. They're on, in a penal colony and they escape and Clark Gable drags her along because uh, she's sexy. You know, there's no other reason. Drags her along and one of the characters turns out to be God. And just very, very strange movie. Strange <laughs> cargo, indeed. Yes, indeed. Now, as the years go by in the fifties, you have the re you have the the new stars coming on the on the market. People like Marilyn Monroe and people like Jane Mansfield. Um, she didn't care too much for those for those type of uh, starlets. Starlets, did she? Well, as she put it. They acted with their boobs. Yeah. She thought they were all, she thought they were vulgar. They were vulgar. They, they didn't have any class. They uh, uh, displayed their, their wares too, too readily, too easily. But she, she liked whatever her flaws, she liked people to have a certain degree of class when they were out in public and representing her industry, you know, the film industry. She that thought they did it. Now there, now after as she enters her last, the last phase of her career, the uh, the horror movie genre, um, which she didn't like to talk about. But did those did those movies make money? Oh, they sure did. Yeah, Baby oh. Jane made a lot of money. That was a tremendous hit. Oh, yeah. Then there was uh, Straight Jacket, the, the two William Castle films she did, and even the the one she did for Herman Cohn in England. Uh, I don't know about Trog, but Berserk. Did well at the box office as well. Okay, so, so she made. Yeah, so she got paid well for them. Kept her, kept her in front of the public. So that's why she did them. After and after Trog, well, she worked with Steven Spielberg when he was very young, on a, on the pilot of Night Gallery, and right. I don't, I don't know who all out there has seen this, but it's it's a really good episode, where she plays a blind woman. And she pays a, a homeless, uh, I'm sorry, not a homeless man, but a, a, a person who owned, who owed um, a loan shark a lot of money for his eyes. Bye. But it, but the strange twist of it is that the, when she wakes up, she can't see anyway because the city's in a blackout. Did she like Bye. working? Very ironic. She liked working with Steven Spielberg, didn't she? She did. She tried to get him fired first because he looked like he was 12 years old. And she thought, this is, I'm not working with somebody who's 12 years old, or at least looks it. But he turned out, obviously, he's had a very highly successful career. So she came to admire him when she worked on him. 
as the years went by, she would send them congratulatory notes because obviously she could recognize someone who was going to make it just like she did, someone who was absolutely determined to make it to the top. And she always admired that in people. So, so she enjoyed working with him once they, they got past the initial problem. Now, age. Yeah, because <laughs> he was like, he was only like about 21 or something like that during the time. Um, the sad, the sad period of her last years. Um, I mean, she passed away alone. Um, you know, and you said, you know, you mentioned that vodka was played a part in it, you know, um, but she quit drinking vodka cold turkey when she found out she was sick. So, um, was she, yes. an, was she an alcoholic or was she, or did she become an alcoholic or not? Oh, uh, whether she was addicted to alcohol, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, she certainly drank excessively throughout the day. She did. Uh, so a heavy drinker at the very least, you know, some mm. people would classify that immediately as alcoholism. They may be right, you know, or some people would say a problem drinker. Some people drink when they have traumatic experiences without being addicted, but the case with her, I don't know. It, who knows? Well, she found, and finally she passes away. Um, then after she's dead, and this is a, this is a pretty a classless um, occurrence by her daughter, Christina. Christina, she gets, her and her brother gets cut out of the will because she went, you know, it sounds like instead of, it sounds like she made up a lot of the stories in the book, Mummy Dearest. And that's the only time I'm going to mention the title of it, you know. Um, and that that's your experience too, isn't it? That, that, that she made up a lot of it. Yes. And, and her, the sisters, the twins certainly said that was the case. They were there in the house at the same time. They never saw crazy action crazy screaming about wire hangers and all that stuff that never happened so. it. and I, of course what led what that led to was your book your and Lawrence Quirk's book um and I really appreciate you doing that so um but again let's see I, I could go on talking a lot longer but we've reached the end of the half hour and I don't want to keep you all night so <laughs> but hey. I appreciate you. I appreciate you taking the time. The uh, the book is Joan Crawford, The Essential Biography. It's by Lawrence Quirk and my guest, William Scholl. And you can buy it now. The paperback paperback version came out last week in February. Uh, you can get it at Amazon.com or any, any uh, brick and mortar store. William Scholl, again, thank you for being on Light the Camera Author. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. And I'm Jim Juno, and that's Light Camera Author for now.